On this episode of This is Game Boy Light, I talk about 10 Game Boy games. Welcome to another episode of This is Game Boy Light. I am E Bloody Candy, EBC, Tony, whatever you really want to call me. Um, and today we're on. I we're Mo's not with me. Mo's doing his own thing today. I'm going to be talking about the Tiny Ten Eleven, um, which is going to be uh, in November. I'll give you all the dates here in a minute. But before we dive into those ten games, just a bit of what I've been up to. I just finished platinuming Ghost of Tsushima. That was uh, pretty pretty boring, super tedious, and I kind of don't want to do it again. <laughs> um, I can't remember if I talked about this in the last episode or not, but NBA Jam for the Game Boy. Um, I did um, a Shipu Iron Leaguer, which we'll talk about more later in this episode as well, because that is part of the Tiny Ten. And uh, Hades. I've been playing a ton of Hades lately. If you if y'all haven't played Hades, it's a roguelike um, game. So think about think of like Binding of Isaac, but super more fast paced and Greek mythology. Uh, it's it's so addictive and so much fun. It's such a good time. Um, yeah, it's oh, it's such a good game. So I've been sinking a lot of time into that. Uh, and then the World of Warcraft uh, pre-patch has released, so I've been playing around with that a bit. Uh, and then next week is Assassin's Creed Valhalla. And if you've been following me for any amount of time, you know that Assassin's Creed is one of my favorite uh, video game series. So, super, super excited for that. But anyway, with all of that aside, um, like I said, we're going to talk about the 10 Game Boy games. Uh, for the Tiny Ten 11th edition, we'll go over the game, the game goal, what to expect with the game, and uh, maybe some tips and tricks for you, for all of you listeners out there that wanting to get maybe into speedrunning a little bit, or maybe want to join the Tiny Ten uh, race. So stay tuned, we'll be right back, and uh, we'll talk about the first game, which will be Shipu Iron Leaguer. Uh, Shipu Iron Leaguer is the first game that we are going to uh, be talking about here. The goal for this game is to beat the entire game, uh, which may sound kind of intimidating, but honestly, it's not all that bad. Uh, this game blind took me about about an hour, hour and a half or so. Um, the game was developed by Sun L and published by Bondi in March of 1994. This is a Japanese exclusive game, but luckily it's one of those games where you don't need to know Japanese to um, play the game. So the way the game starts off as you come out, you start out with uh, two characters. You have a ninja and you have a robot that throws baseballs. Um, each character has its own unique style to it. So the one that throws baseballs has a ranged projectile. While a ninja has melee, but the ninja can jump super high in the air. Um, as you complete the game, you're gonna come across bosses. Once you once you beat the bosses, you basically get them to join your team. Um, so the first boss that you face off against is a kendo boss, and once you've defeated the kendo boss, the kendo boss is part of your team. What the kendo boss can, do, or what the kendo guy can do is that it can wall climb. So when you jump up, if you swing your kendo at the wall, you can stick the kendo into the wall and jump up again. 
Um, as you progress through the game, the game does progressively get a little harder and harder, but it's nothing nothing too too serious. The game offers five stages with three challenges in between. Uh, you, the three challenges are baseball, basketball, and soccer. Uh, your baseball challenge is to hit the baseball that is thrown at you. Once you've hit the baseball, I think it's three or four times, you win the challenge, and you move on to uh, stage three. I believe it is. And then the basketball challenge is you have to make three baskets. And then the soccer challenge is you have to score three goals. I found the soccer challenge to be exceptionally difficult, uh, mostly because like the hitboxes are a little weird. And every time that you jump, you lose 10 seconds every time that you jump. It's a timed event. Uh, so it was a it was a bit of a learning curve with the with the soccer one. The basketball one, the hardest part about that was timing the shot. It's not one of those you you shoot when the basket is in front of you. You kind of have to lead the basket a bit. So you have to shoot a few seconds before the basket is going to be in front of you in order to make the shot. All while you have a guy flying in front of the basket, blocking your shot and throwing bombs at you. This game offers five stages. Um, and honestly, the stages aren't all that hard. You will use your different characters throughout all of the stages. Like in stage two, when you get the kendo stick guy, you're greeted right away with a climbing wall. So it kind of teaches you right away, like, hey, you need to pick the kendo guy and then stick to the wall and climb the wall. Like it, it kind of teaches you right away that, hey, you got this new character. This is how you're going to play with him. This is how you're going to test it out. Um, by the end of the game, I think you have something like six or seven characters to choose from. Uh, something really, really cool about the game is that when you lose a character, they die, but you pick up where you left off and you can sacrifice health from certain characters to give it to the dead character to revive them because sometimes in the stages in order to progress you need certain characters if that character is dead then you need to give them health to progress through the stage if you game over in the game so when you die when you completely die lose all your characters you game over and when you continue it literally just continues where you left off so if you were on a boss fight you game over and you hit continue you start at that boss fight it's exceptionally a forgiving video game uh, as for health pickups, I couldn't find all too many health pickups. They look like little batteries because you kind of control little robots. Um, I couldn't find too many for health pickups, but honestly, for how easy this game actually is and for how short this game actually is, you kind of just don't need them, um, especially with the whole health sacrifice and giving it to another robot deal, and especially with just continu unlimited continues letting you to pick up wherever... Uh, you left off is really you just don't have a need for health pickups ultimately. Um, but that's Iron that's Iron League uh, Shipu Iron Leaguer. Uh, some tips and uh, some t tips and tricks about this. Um, if, so typically you would press select, uh, and that would bring up that would bring up a menu of all the characters that you can choose from. Otherwise, you can just press start or start plus down. For reverse ordering that would just quick swap between characters as you're playing the game um for this the the for the, the rules for the race is you will start the game when you select new game and then you will fit you will swap to the next game um on the final screen where it shows all seven robots uh, leaderboard for this game first place is by near uh, 14 minutes and 27 seconds that was three years ago um, we have a few people with the tiny 10 uh, practicing for tiny 10 that is a uh, very much up and coming um, and I, I'm excited to see what they can what they can do to the game itself uh, moving on to game two it's one of my, it was my requested game and one of probably one of my favorites in the list is Yonkin Man or Jankin Man, however you want to uh, pronounce it. But you have Yonkin Man, and Yonkin Man is a beat to full game as well. Uh, however, it's a very, 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 very short game. Um, 
Yonkin Man was published by NCS in December 27th of 1991. Uh, so a fairly early game in the Game Boy life cycle. Um, this game offers four stages plus a hidden stage. So with this game, there are no attacks. You don't attack enemies at all. You jump on their head to bounce off of them, but you don't kill the enemy at all. If the enemy runs into you, the enemy does fall down, and you also fall down, but you also lose time. Every stage, you have a time limit to get through it. And as you progress through the stage, every time you pick, if you pick up a certain power-up, you'll gain time or you'll gain speed. But if you pick up a other quote-unquote power-up or item, you'll lose time. So you kind of have to understand what the power up, which power-ups are what, and which ones take away your time and which ones give you time. And also that the roller blades give you speed. So everything on this game is basically in a, in, a, in a cycle of a sort. I'm not sure if it's a global cycle or a level cycle, but everything is on a cycle. So everything is very movement and time sensitive in this game. If you're looking to optimally get through it. Once you get at the end of every stage, there is a quote unquote boss fight where you have to save one of your friends. The boss fight isn't your traditional boss fight where you have to kill the boss and move on. It's a rock, paper, scissors fight. Um, so typically, you know, you, you pick paper to beat rock, scissors to beat paper, etc., etc. And in this game here, most of the time what you're going to do is just mash the A button. And you're probably just automatically going to choose paper or rock or scissor until you actually win the game. The only caveat to this is if every time that you get one wrong, you do lose time. And if you lose time, you die and you have to start the stage over again. Um, there, like I said, there are four stages. And the issue with the game in general is that you have to pick your stage the stage doesn't automatically progress to the next one once you've beat the stage you have to manually press down and a to move on to the next stage once you've beaten the first four stages you are then uh you then activate the, the hidden stage the fifth stage which is the true final stage of the game where you get to face off against the final boss once and for all um, as you progress through the game, the first three stages are insanely easy, exceptionally easy first three stages. Once you get to the fourth stage, it's a little bit tougher because you have a lot more enemies in your way, a lot more obstacles that you need to jump over, and a lot more deep uh, uh, timer killer pickups in the way as well too. And once you get to the fifth stage, you are greeted with immediate enemies and with immediate items that take away time from your clock. So the fifth stage... Even though the game is easy with unlimited continues, the fifth stage does pose a challenge more so to your timer than anything else. Um, tips and tricks with this game is literally just spam. If you're if you're not looking for an amazing time at all, uh, it's you're spamming paper during the rock paper scissor bouts at the end of the stages. Uh, yeah, don't forget about pressing down to go into the next stage. Rules for this game is that you start the game from pressing start on the title screen and you move on to the next game uh, once you've done your final rock, paper, scissors bout with the final boss of Yonkin Man. Uh, leaderboard for this. This game has gotten a lot of love in the, in the last few days. Uh, world record right now is held by Atroz with a 4 minute and 49 seconds, followed by St. Joe and... Orb 7 with 5 minute 18 seconds and a 5 minute 23 second time. All of these are within 4 to 6 days of one another. Uh, the previous world record for this was from a person named Squiggles with a time of 5 minute 35 seconds, which was a year ago. So with this game has gotten a lot, a lot of love within the last uh, last few days. Moving on to game three, which is Bram Stoker's Dracula. Um, I don't know what the decision was to put this game uh, into into the Tiny Ten. Uh, this game is uh, is uh, very well known for not being very good, both Game Boy NES and Super NES versions. Um, the, the game goal for this is to beat the game on easy 
and the game was developed by Probe Entertainment and published by Sony ImageSoft and released in September of 1993. So before we dive into the game a bit on these developers and publishers, Sony ImageSoft published Cliffhanger. I want you all to let that soak in a little bit. All right. Probe. I lost my notes. Probe did Mortal Kombat 1. Okay, y'all y'all still listening? So you already know it's going to be super laggy to, to start. Mortal Kombat 2. The Page Master, Stargate, Jelly Boy, Judge Dredd, uh, Mortal Kombat 1 and 2 Combo, WWF Warzone, and uh, yeah, so you, they've already have some pretty notoriously bad performance FPS issued games already in, already developed with this, so... With that said, if you've played Cliffhanger on the Game Boy, you've almost played Bram Stoker's Dracula on Game Boy. Um, even though they were developed by two different companies, they very, very much play very similar in terms of delayed controls, um, kind of a weird physics engine, and your buttons sometimes just straight up not working. <laughs> period um the game does have a bit of a charm to it and the game is very short especially on easy um so going with the game here on easy mode you only complete three stages um of the game so the first stage is you basically just you're supposed to be outside in like the courtyard to make your way into dracula's castle but if if you know where you're going, if you know all the secrets, you kind of just hook left right away at the start and ground pound and you fall to the bottom and you go into a tunnel that leads you right to the end of the stage. Um, from there, this takes you into stage two, which puts you into another courtyard or a graveyard or something. Uh, here's where like enemies and actual platforming kind of comes into play. Um, if you miss your platforming, you fall into a pit and die. Everything in this game is very much based off of cycles as well, too. If you take too long getting through a stage or through a section, ghosts and enemies are going to start appearing, and you're going to kind of have a bit of a bad time, uh, because once you've taken, I think it's three or four hits of damage, your guy just falls over, and when you game over, you game over, so... Uh, luckily, like I said, the game, the, the speed run for this is exceptionally short. Um, in stage two, what you want to do is you're going to get, pick up a couple of extra hearts at the end of stage two. Remember how I said that cliff, it has very similar controls to cliffhanger. So when you jump, you kind of have to do it either a little bit early or a little bit too late, but you also are going to slide a little bit as well too. And the, and the controls are slightly delayed in this game. So be weary of that but once you get towards the end of stage two you're going to pick up some extra hearts to add into your your health pool and then once you go on to fight the the wraith or the spectre or whatever it is the game actually gives you stones to to fight it with so as you as you're about to fight the boss stones flow from the bottom of the screen and you grab them run to the left up against the wall look right and you throw stones i, th I believe it's like 11 stones to kill the wraith uh, the Wraith will start to explode in grandiose fashion, and then you move on to uh, stage three. There's four stages. Sorry, I lied to you all. Um, and these are all dictated by days. Uh, so you have morning one, night one, morning two, night two. Um, so now we're into morning two or day two morning. And now we're inside of the castle, but kind of like in the sewer system type deal. And... You're, you're going through this, and there's water on the ground that does hurt you. Uh, there's switches that you have to hit to activate platforms throughout the stages. 
there are platforms that you need to land on that will start to move you forward. And with the momentum of the moving forward platform, if you're moving forward and jumping with the moving forward platform, it'll actually give you a bit of a boost horizontally as well too while moving. Um, as you progress up the sewer, you will start to encounter spikes where everything is again on a timer. Uh, so if your timing is off, you're going to wait for the spikes. And remember, since everything is on a timer, if you have to wait for so if you have to wait for stuff all the time, ghouls and ghosts and everything are going to start to pop up out of out of nowhere. They're going to start spawning into the game. They're actually going to start giving you a fairly hard time, especially in the middle section of the game, where you have to do a lot of jumping and dodging of spikes. So once you get to the very top of this sewer system, so to speak. Uh, you have a grabby hand that will do damage to you, but you have a couple of moving platforms that if you don't land on the moving platforms, you'll fall to your death and have to start the stage over again. You do have lives. Uh, once you get past the two moving platforms, you end morning, morning two, and then you go into day two, night, or night two. This is the final level of the speed run for easy. This is the final stage for easy in general. Um... This stage poses a lot of threats if you're not careful. So you can most of the time see when something is about to hit you or something is coming after you. Towards the beginning of the stage, there is a weapon that lets you throw three rocks at once. It's basically a spread shot. So you want to collect that right away and make your way towards the right. Uh, you're going to ride a very long horizontal side-scrolling platform where things are going to be coming from the water, like water jets and stuff like that. So as you progress through that and jump right, you're going to have to do a, a ground pound to get through the ground. So this is where things get a little shady because this is where the ghosts are going to start spawning in. And if you don't know where they spawn in, you're going to get hit. Uh, and managing health points from here on out is absolutely crucial, especially in a speed run. So as you start to progress left on the stage... Uh, ghosts are going to start spawning in. So if you're casually playing this game, you're going to kind of want to just like tiptoe your way a bit to the left until you eventually hit a switch where you're going to get to a platform that is going to go in a zigzag fashion to the other side of the water. So here you're going to have to get your first checkpoint or your save point, which is a lantern. You're going to walk over. It's going to light up. That's your checkpoint. If you die, that's where you spawn again. So here we're going to come across against our first mini boss, which is a, uh, a, a ghost, basically. Um, the ghost has a very set pattern. There's nothing RNG with the ghost at all. Um, basically, just memorize the pattern. It's very easy to see what the ghost is about to do, whether you need to duck under the ghost or jump over the ghost. It's really up, you know, it's really whatever the pattern is it presents to you is like I said, there's no RNG to it at all. It's just memorizing what's happening. You can see what's happening right before your eyes as well. Uh, there's no beating the ghost. Like you don't have to attack the ghost at all. It's once it's done its pattern a few times, it'll just disappear and the screen will move on. Then you do a ground pound in the first pit that you see. And then you hook a right. There's going to be a person right there, jump over them or kill them, whatever you want to do. Uh, then there's going to be another checkpoint uh, towards the end of this. So now we have a couple of platforms that we need to get through. No real big deal. Honestly, there's a health pickup on one of the floating platforms. Pick that up to full heal yourself. Move on to the end. There's another checkpoint there. Grab it. Kill the bats that are in front of the final, uh, quote unquote final boss. Enter the final boss fight. Um, hang left, hang right, whatever you want to hang at. And just spam the boss. I think it takes 11 hits again. The boss will explode. The game will run it, roll its "quote unquote" credits, saying like, "Hey, did you really beat the game?" Because the game is meant to be meant to be beaten on uh, normal difficulty, kind of like Contra: Alien Wars. Um, and yeah, that's that's the game. There's really no tips or tricks with this game at all. Um, there's no RNG with the game. It's all timing based. And it's just memorizing where everything is at. So if you can get get your movement and timing down and just memorize all the patterns and stuff, that's really the only tip and trick I can give you for this game. Uh, it's not a hard speed run. I got a sub four in like an hour of just throwing attempts at it. It's not a hard speed run. It's a very short speed run. Uh, but it does take a little bit of memorization to do it. 
Um, the rules for this game will you you start the game once you've selected your difficulty. In this case, it is easy, and then the the game transition starts uh, once Dracula has completely disappeared on the end of night two. Uh, leaderboard for this, uh, we're looking at one year ago, the world record on easy is from Amen Anthem at 3 minutes 43 seconds. Um, and there hasn't been a lot of, uh, there hasn't been any uh, new submissions for this game from the Tiny 10. Uh, my submission is the newest on the leaderboard from two months ago with a 3 minute 59 second time. So. I'm um, hoping to see some Tiny Ten Runners throw some times at Dracula. I have a feeling that they might be seeing Dracula and being like, oh, that's an easy game, or it's a short enough game. I don't really don't need to practice it. And it's the it's gonna be the game of uh it's gonna be the game of pain for, for a lot of them. So really excited to see uh see that happen. <laughs> Next game is Roadster. So our first real racing game of the Tiny Ten. Uh, this game is actually a lot of fun. Uh, it has a little bit of a, a little bit of a, a, a depth to it, if if you will. Um, the 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 goal of the game is to beat five races. It doesn't matter if you're in first place or not. The game is uh, the goal is just to beat five races. It was developed by Tose and published by Tonkin House in October of ni October nineteenth of nineteen ninety. Very early Game Boy game, uh, but still a very very fun game. So this game offers three different race modes. I believe it's like five, ten, and twenty. Uh, for the Tiny Ten itself, we're only let, we're, we're making the racers do race mode five. Um, when the game starts out, typically, like in the racing games, like you know, you hold B to get everything going and you just launch off the uh, the start line. But in this game, you actually have different gears. So your A button is your low gear, and your B button is your high gear to go faster. So when you're starting off the start line, you want to start with the A button until you get to a certain speed, and then you want to switch to the B button to go into a higher gear to go at faster speeds. Uh, it's a very interesting uh, game to start uh, everything with. And then as you play through the game, when you hit, when you hit another uh, vehicle, your car spins a little bit. Uh, if you hit a if you hit a wall, your car takes damage. Even if you hit another car, your 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 car takes damage. Um, you have body damage and you have wheel damage on your gauges as well too. With race mode five, that's something you kind of just don't need to worry about at all. There is a pit stop that you can take to repair the stuff, but honestly, like it, once you figure out how the actual controls work with the low and high uh, high gears you probably won't have much issue taking first or second place every single race. This game does have issues with rubber banding, though. I have noticed that whenever I played this game, I had issues that I would be in first place, and all of a sudden I would have just two CPUs on my rear end immediately. Um, so it does have some rubber, rubber banding problems with it. Um, and the game can become a little unfair at times, especially if cars start to hit you and spin you out of control. And if you take so much damage, your guy can be ejected from the car and you have to walk back to your car to get back into it. And that takes forever. Your guy walks slower than grass grows. Uh, tips and tricks for this game. Honestly, the only tips and tricks I can give people for this is to... Uh, figure out the low and high gears. Once you've once you've mastered low and high gears from the start uh, starting line, you are a you are going to be a roadster god. Um, the game will start once they have selected their race mode, and the game will end once they've crossed the finish line on race five. Like I said earlier, they don't need to finish first place. Um, in every race, they don't need to finish first place at the end of uh, at the end of the race mode, but there's a chance, there's a high likely chance that they will just because of how easy the first five races actually are. Uh, also, as you play through the game, you can up you can upgrade your body and your tires as well too. But again, not a not a thing that they are going to be worrying about in race mode five. Leaderboard for Roadster. 
we are looking at eight draws with a world record time of six minutes, 56 seconds from three days ago. Uh, then we have St. Joe in second, and we have JK Loser in third place. Uh, all of these are very recent times within the last week. Um, the old world record before this was from Bald Nate um, six months ago at seven minutes and five seconds. So, um, and that is race mode five, by the way. <clears throat> Moving on to game five. This is a very interesting game. Uh, I didn't know what I was doing in this game, and I honestly still have no idea what I'm doing in this game. Uh, the game is called Money Idol Exchanger. Um, apparently, this is a fairly popular game uh, amongst retro stuff, but I, I personally have never really played it at all. Uh, until I had to reveal it for the Tiny 10. But the goal for this is on easy mode versus the CPU. This game was developed by C-Lab and published by Athena in August 29th of 1997. A very late entry into the Game Boy, which means that this is a Super Game Boy Enhanced game. Um, I don't even know how to describe this game um this game is kind of like uh how do you how do you describe a game like this <laughs> um so you have at the top so at the top of the screen you have a bunch of coins that range from 1 5 10 50 and 100 what you need to do is that you need to match up these coins together to make bigger coins. The biggest coin that you can have is 500. So once you've once you've matched up your 100 coins, you'll get a 500 coin, and you can kind of break stuff with them. Um, I don't know how you progress through this game at all. I have played the game a couple of different times, and I, I just I don't know what the progression of this game is. Um, it kind of just happens at random, but the game is essentially like your Bejeweled or your, your Candy Crush or whatever. You have to match a bunch of things together in order to make, um, combos that are then sent to your enemy or your, your opponent and things happen over there that you can't see because it's Game Boy. Um, but all you need to know with this game is... That you are collecting the same coins. So if you see like three fives on the left and like two fives on the right, you're gonna collect the coins and put them all together so you can create a ten. Then you're gonna put the tens together, the 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 fifties, the one hundreds, the five hundreds, etc. etc. You don't you want to keep this block as short as possible coming to the top. If you let the block come too far down to the bottom, it's going to cause a game over. Um, the issue with this game is that there are limited continues with this game. So with that said, there are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. There, there are seven stages to this game, I believe, that you have to go through. Um, so, like I said, without understanding the progression behind the actual game itself, limited continues. Um... Things can get a little hairy, a little quick, especially in the later stages. Uh, it's just figuring out your patterns, figuring out how to make combo. Make, making combos is your biggest thing that you can do in this game. Um, yeah, that's really all I have to say about this game. I, like I said, like I don't know how to like really talk about this puzzle game at all. It's one of those you kind of have to play it to understand it, and even then you probably still won't really understand it. <laughs> Um, the rules for this game is that you will start it up on versus the CPU on easy difficulty, and then you will swap to the next game, uh, when the win appears on the last CPU fight. Leaderboard for this game, this game hasn't had any action yet at all, either from the Tiny 10 submissions, uh, world record is from Knight at 4 minutes and 58 seconds from a year ago, followed by Melon Slice. So, Money Idol Exchanger. 
cool game. If you like if you like anime, you'll absolutely love it. So, uh, and with that, we're gonna take a quick break, and then when we come back, we're gonna dive into the second half of the Tiny Ten Eleven game list. This is where, in my opinion, the game list really starts to ramp up in difficulty. So stay tuned. Alright, welcome back everybody. Game 6. Game 6 of the Tiny 10. Uh, this game has been requested to be in the Tiny 10 for a while. And y'all are y'all are getting it. Y'all are getting it. And that is Kid Icarus of Myths and Monsters. And the goal for this game is to beat the entire game. Uh, this is a game that I have only briefly have played. I have never beaten the Game Boy Kid Icarus game before. I have played the NES version plenty of times, but I have never beaten the Game Boy version of this game. This game was developed by Tosei again. We had another Tosei game published by Nintendo. Came out in November of 1991, so so fairly early in the Game Boy life cycle. Um, what can I say about this game? This game is kind of notoriously difficult um has amounts of rng into it um but it does play if you've played the nes version in my opinion you've kind of played a little bit of the game boy version um depending on who you ask people will tell you that the game boy version is better than the nes version some people say that the nes version is better than the game boy version uh i am one of the second people where i haven't i I I prefer the NES version over the Game Boy version, and it's maybe because I just haven't played the Game Boy version enough to really give a or have a proper idea about it. Uh, but I personally prefer the NES version over the Game Boy version. But that's not saying that this version is bad. Uh, this version is still quite good. The version and it's it's still kind of tough as tough as balls. It's easier than the NES version. Um, from what the little bit I have played, but it is still um, it is it is still tough. It's not one of those games that you're just going to hop into and you're immediately just going to be beating the game like Shipu Iron Leaguer. <laughs> um, so we have type we have the levels right. You have the Underworld Tower, you have the Overworld, you have the Sky World Tower, and then you have a Sky Palace. Um, Excuse me. So as you go through the game, either, this is a game similar to like the NES, where you have to collect some, you have to collect X amount of points, which are these hearts, and then you can use these points to get upgrades, weapons, whatever it may be. Um, there are pop-ups that come up across the screens, like you have a harp which turns all enemies into hammers. Um, you have a feather that once once Pit collects the feather, he, you can fly for a short period of time by, by tapping A. Uh, you have a credit card, which lets you buy one item from the black market. Um, the hammer itself, uh, you can use them as weapons or to turn uh, centurions into items. Uh, but using a, using a hammer does shatter the hammer as well. Um... You have the flaming torch, which shows Pitt's location in on a, on a fortress map. Uh, the pencil marks where Pitt has been on the fortress map, etc. So, so you have plenty of items to help you progress through the game itself. Um, you're gonna come across various different types of enemies, but some of the common enemies that you will see throughout the entire game are gonna be snakes, bats, spitball blobs. Um, or called Magoos in the NES version, um, the Grim Reaper and the Reapets and Totems. Uh, those are going to be your common, common, common enemies, your common foes as you attack them. Tips, uh, tips for the game. Like honestly, like I said, uh, the speed run I think is around like 20, 25 minutes. 
Uh, some of the biggest tips I can give you for this game is learn the controls. They are floaty and slippery a little bit. They're not awful, but there there is a little bit of slip to them. Um, and understand health and currency management. Those are probably the two biggest tips that I can give to someone playing through or trying to learn the speed run of the game. Um, when we go into stage 1-4, you're going to face off against the Minotaur, which is the Fortress Guardian. Uh, the Minotaur is a fairly difficult fight, um, but if you know how to approach it, again, just like any other boss fight in the world, it shouldn't be all too bad. Um, if he is standing on the floor, uh, if you should only attack him if he's standing on the floor or on one of the two lower backs, um, through the gap in the fireballs. So if he, so how do I, ugh, ladies, you might need to cut this out because I'm trying, I wrote this awful in my notes. You should only attack the Minotaur when he is either standing on the floor or on one of the, the two lower platforms. Um, if he's standing on the floor, uh, shoot three arrows at him and he's going to retreat. And then he's going to, there's going to be some fireballs that you just need to need to dodge and then shoot some more arrows at him. That's all you need to do, basically. Pretty, pretty simple fight. Uh, then you go into the overworld which is stage two. Once you get into 2-4, you're going to fight the Skull Wing. Uh, this, this fight, in my opinion, is easy. This is as far as I got in the Game Boy version, too, mind you. Uh, this fight is... It, this is probably one of the easier fights I've, I've had in a Kid Icarus game. Uh, stay on the middle platform and shoot as many arrows into him as you can while dodging him. Uh, he's gonna he's he'll he'll swoop onto the middle platform, or he'll drop a fire bomb. Dodge it, keep laying some arrows into him. It's a super easy fight. Very very predictive pattern. Uh, now we go into the Sky World Tower, which is stage three. Uh, so this is a this is a world that I have very limited experience in. However. I have watched many of speedruns of this game and I've watched casual playthroughs of this game. So you're going to face off against the Fire Serpent in 3-4. Judging by how people have fought this thing, it looks stupid easy. Uh, stay in the bottom right corner of the room and then you kind of get into a rhythm and shot uh, with the Fire Serpent. So while dodging him in his three-way fire blast, you, you get into a jumping rhythm where you're just going to start laying arrows into him while dodging his little fireballs. Uh, now we go into the Sky Palace, which is stage four. So we go into, uh, basically this is one, one big stage from what I remember. And this is where you fight uh, Orcos. Um, you've made it to the final boss. So uh, Orcos has two forms. The first is smaller, quicker, um, frankly easier version of him um and the final form is giant harder uh but there are patterns to kill him with the first form fly around um helter skelter and uh shoot him while avoiding the flame balls that he'll breathe at you once you get enough shots into him he's going to he's going to start phasing into his giant form uh with his giant form there is a um, there is some patterns you can do. The patterns I've seen the most is that you shoot him in the head, drop down, weave in between the fireballs, uh, stay low until he finishes shooting spikes out of his tail, and then fly and then uh, fly up while killing all the bats that are produced. Uh, shoot him in the head again, rinse and repeat the pattern. Um, and once you've once you've beat Orcos, you've beaten the game. Um, yeah, that's, that's Kid Icarus, myths, myths, myths and monsters. Um, rules for this game, the game starts upon selecting a new game, and then you will phase out of, uh, you will swap to the next game once you hear the final boss exploding. 
Uh, you can continue, of course, if you do die in this game. Leaderboard for this game, we have a world record by one of my good friends, Zorlax7, at 19 minutes and 39 seconds from three years ago. Uh, this game hasn't gotten a lot of love uh, within... Within, within the last while. Uh, we've had a couple runs within the last week, but anything before that is uh, three years, four years, two years, and six years ago. So this game doesn't get a ton of love like the NES version does, which is kind of a shame because uh, this game is is pretty, pretty all right. Moving on to the next game, we have Gradius, the Interstellar Assault. Beat the game on easy. So, Gradius, of course, developed and published by Konami, back when Konami made very good games, and released in January of 1992. Uh, this game is also known as Nemesis 2, The Return of the Hero in Europe, and just Nemesis 2 in Japan. Uh, we actually found out that the versions are slightly different, too, so that's kind of interesting as well. But, moving on with this game, so Gradius here... Uh, Gradius has six stages, uh, and it plays just like a Gradius game. Uh, um, at the bottom, uh, once you start up, once you start up the game, at the very bottom of the of the screen, you'll see the the options to speed up, shield, lasers, bullets, uh, having a object or like a little buddy with you that shoots lasers and whatnot missiles to shoot top and bottom of the of the caverns um it's it's a gradius game uh it has six stages uh the intro you can actually die in the intro as we found out as i found out <laughs> i found out while revealing the tiny 10 you can die in the intro part of the game while being chased through like an uh, an asteroid field so to speak um, my one issue with this game that I have is that you start off so slow, so, so, so slow. Um, I recommend like one of the first upgrades that you get is, a, is at least a speed up or two right away, just so you can just dodge things efficiently. Um, I personally would, I personally would tell you to cap your speed out in this game um because this it's how just how slow you actually move and it's not lag or anything like that it's just how slow the actual the actual jet moves in itself um really there's not much to tell about this game if you like i say if you played a gradius you've played a gradius um boss one is a two-headed boss and I mean, you just you just you just shoot you just shoot the boss, right? So, uh, you just you just you shoot the boss. It's Gradius. You've played Gradius before. If you haven't played Gradius, go play Gradius. I don't. I mean, I really don't know what else to tell you about Gradius. Um, tips and tricks of this game: the JP version, Nemesis Two, um, is is the one being used for the Tiny Ten, as it, it does have a slightly faster way to beat the second boss. Uh, rules for this game is that you're going to uh, start the game upon your loadout and then you are going to swap games once you lose control after killing the final boss. Continuing is allowed and you can choose whatever loadout that you wish to use. Uh, record for this game is from Neat, Neat, Neat Suhiro at 17 minutes 48 seconds. 33, 333 milliseconds, five months ago, and right behind him is Atroz with 17 minutes, 48 seconds, and 583 milliseconds from a week ago. Um, so this game has gotten a little bit of love within the last few days or within the last week uh, due to Tiny 10 shenanigans. So excited to see someone maybe claim a new world record on that. That'd be kind of fun to watch or see or happen. Uh, next game on the list. This is probably my th my favorite of the ten games on the list, and this is Roland's Curse. Uh, Roland's Curse is beat the game glitchless. So this game does have two categories in speedrun: glitched, 
which is if you kill the boss and die on the same frame, uh, you can credit warp um, and beat the game that way. This is, in this case, glitchless, so it's about a 20 to 25 minute run. Uh, this game was developed by NMK and published by American Sammy, released in January of 1991. So again, fairly early in the Game Boy life cycle. Um, this game is an early RPG game where it's a, it's an action RPG where it's not like the turn based where like you encounter and then you guys swap turns. It's you can do all of your actions right away in the overworld and on the boss fight. You don't have to take turns. You don't have to strategize. You don't have to do anything crazy like that at all. It's just an action RPG right off the get go. Um... So as you progress throughout the game, you will get uh, you will get some power ups throughout the way. Uh, you have you have two weapons that you're going to have. You're going to have a sword, and you can get a fire wand that that shoots fireballs. Um, the fireballs reach almost three squares out, and it's it does half the damage that the sword does. Um, even though, like in the game, like the attack powers are the same in the game, it doesn't do as much damage as the sword does. Uh, usable items that you have throughout the game that you can use is the potion of life, uh, the magic axe, which kind of looks like a pickaxe, but you can use it to destroy some rocks, trees, and whatever else is blocking your path. The chameleon ring, um, that lets you. Uh, turn an obstacle uh, appropriate to the terrain type or turn into an obstacle appropriate to the terrain type. Uh, that way enemies don't pay attention to you and they can just bounce off of you as well. Shield of Valor is, well, it's a, it's a shield. You know, it, it'll block fireballs um, when they hit you, but it won't, it won't damage you. Um, and you can spin in place while you're having the shield open as well. The Power Crystal is an orb. And when you hold down the A button, it, it charges up. And when it reaches full power, um, you just release the A button. And it'll fire a, a big old fireball across the screen. And, uh, yeah, that's all it is. Uh, use some pickup items. You have small potions. So every, time, so every once in a while, if you kill an enemy, it has a chance of dropping a small potion. Looks like a vial. You pick it up. It fills up two hearts of your health bar. Uh, Merlin's cape looks like it kind of looks like a cape, and it renders you invincible for a short amount of time. Um, it gives you different music, and it flashes your your sprite. Upgrade items. You have life heart, uh, which looks like just a heart, and it gives you two permanent hit points to your health pool. Chainmail looks like a suit of armor, and adds one temporary point of life to your maximum. The strength glove. Adds one permanent point to your attack power. Uh, sword. Uh, something sharp and pointy with a handle to hold on with it if you don't know what a sword is. Uh, adds one temporary point to your attack power and changes your weapon to a, to a sword. Uh, as if you weren't already using one. And then, yeah, you have the fire rod, which is a, which is a rod that shoots fireballs. Adds one temporary point to your attack power. Changes your weapon to a fire wand. Like I said, you... Fire wand's pointless. All right, so the first boss, I don't, I don't have names for these bosses at all. Although I do have the manual, but it's put away, so no manual for you guys. Um, this boss is easy. Uh, it, it's, it's super easy. So he moves in a figure eight fashion at the top of the room. And whenever he's closest to the bottom, he's going to drop some zigzagging balls. Uh, and when he pauses in the middle, he's going to drop some... Sh uh, sh he's going to shoot down uh, the, the sender. Uh, note that the edges of, of the area remain kind of uncovered. Stand on the either edge and snipe as he, as he swoops by. Eventually, he's going to like pause in the center, run over, stab him a bunch of times, and run back to the edge. Easy peasy, honestly. Uh, stage two boss, chapter two, whatever you want to call it. 
Uh, again, once you know the pattern of this thing, it's, it's really easy. It starts off in the center near the upper edge, uh, and then moves right, left, right, left, right. Uh, moving downwards a bit between each segment, uh, ending in the center of the bottom edge. Uh, he'll open his eye and move in a diamond pattern, uh, converging on the center of the screen and then returning to uh, his starting position, at which point he'll close his eye in preparation for the whole cycle again. Um, this is probably when I would suggest, like it's probably the only time I'll ever probably tell you to use the fire wand, but um, take your fire wand out because it has a bit of a distance reach to it. Um, and you can kind of reduce this distance between you and the boss as it's moving. And then stay in the upper left corner and just shoot him whenever the opportunity just presents itself. If you don't have it, then pick your spots, stab it, move away. Again, a, a fairly easy fight once, you, once you've seen the pattern. Uh, this boss is kind of a jerk so chapter three boss is kind of a jerk don't get hit by him he does a ton of damage to you if he touches you um there's gonna be two notches in the surrounding pillars that provide ample coverage while you observe his pattern so you don't have to like eagerly start slashing at this thing immediately um it's a it's a muscular gent he starts off by charging down one corridor uh, and then having reached the end, he'll recoil and transform into a, a, a boulder thing, person, guy. Um, and then he'll rise up, move to the other corridor, thumping down at regular intervals. Um, you can kind of just duck underneath while he's high in the air and then the boulders and the... Tr um, The bol yeah, so the boulder, boulder guy then transforms back into a humanoid and repeats the pattern. Um, hit him whenever you basically feel safe. This, this fight is a little bit of pain in the ass, but um, you don't have to eagerly dive into the fight. You can kind of hang back behind some pillars and see how the fight actually uh, unfolds. So then we go into chapter 4, which is the final chapter of Roland's Curse. Um... So we're about to fight Barius, and Barius suffers from some of the same flaws as previous bosses, as he is highly predictable. Uh, Barius attacks by teleporting from corner to corner, starting in the upper left, moving to the lower right, then to the lower left, and finally visiting the upper right, before going to the upper left and starting all over again. Uh, while he's in pattern, um, for the first teleport being two squares up, and right from uh, the upper left corner, uh, yeah, right from the lower left corner, sorry, uh, will keep you safe. So the second and third teleports leave the upper left corner free, and then the fourth doesn't touch the lower left teleporting. Um, that's where you're going to get your hits in. Uh, not that getting hit during teleport hurts all too much for you. It, it does four life points of damage. Um, you don't want to get it too often because it will kill you, obviously, but it'll eventually die and credits will scroll. But again, the final boss is, is stupid easy. Um, miscellaneous notes about the game. If you want to know about it, your attack power is capped at 16 points, uh, similar to your maximum life power is capped at 32 points. So don't even bother trying to upgrade past those numbers. Uh, if you have 14 permanent attack power and two temporary attack power and attempt to pick up a strength glove, then your permanent attack power will go to 15 while your temporary attack power will drop to 1 for a continuous total of 16. So there you go. If you think you can just like stack up full, full attack power and go ham, you are very, very, very wrong. <laughs> um... The, the game will start once, up, once the person selects one player, and then the, you will choose your next game uh, once the final text appears on the screen. You are allowed to continue if you do game over. 
Uh, this game's world record as of right now for glitchless is from Atroz at 23 minutes 55 seconds one week ago. Prior world record was from Wolf Merrick at 24 minutes and 26 seconds two years ago. So this game's gotten a little bit of love in the past few days. Um, still waiting for more any percent runs to happen though, because that's the category I run. <laughs> um, all right, moving on. Next game. I don't know how this game made, made it end before Shaq Fu, but it did. We got Mortal Kombat 2 on the Game Boy. The goal for this is to beat the game on medium difficulty with any character. And from what I can tell in the Tiny 10 chats that are happening, everyone is playing as Jax. Uh, <laughs> This game was developed by Probe Entertainment and published by Acclaim in September of 1994. So, not too early in the life cycle, but not too late as well either. Um, like I said, people are going to play this play this as as Jax. Um, it's it's Mortal Kombat. I really don't know what. Uh, I really don't know what to say more about Mortal Kombat. I mean, I feel like Mortal Kombat's kind of a cult classic at this point. Uh, it's a it's a it's a beat 'em up, not even a beat 'em up. It's a fighting game. It's a fighting game where you basically spam the same move over and over again until you win the game. <laughs> it's really all I can tell you. Uh, people are going to pick Jax because he's the best option because his kick reach is insane. Um, Rules for this game is you start the game upon selecting a fighter and you swap the game when Khan starts to explode. Records for this game is from Tentka at 5 minutes and 30 seconds with Jax two months ago. Heat Gaming at 5 minutes 33 seconds with Jax one year ago. Uh, and we have some newer entries into this game due to the Tiny 10. But nothing, nothing too substantial in terms of brand new submissions. Um, Mortal Kombat. Should have been Shaq Fu. <laughs> and then the final game of it all. Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 3 Radical Rescue. And you're probably thinking to yourself, wow, EBC, that's a pretty long game to have in a tiny 10. There must be a goal, right? There is a goal. There's always a goal. Always a goal. But you know what the goal is for this game? It is to beat the entire game. Because this game is so good that you shouldn't not see the ending of this game. This game is developed and published by Konami in November of 1993. Uh, this game is, in Mola's favorite term, a Metroidvania. Where you start off as Michelangelo, I believe it is. And you need to rescue your three your three turtle brothers and along the way you are going to pick up health upgrades and amongst other upgrades along the way as well too and you're going to be fighting some bosses as well uh, a tip to this game a small pizza will drop every 10 kills a big pizza responds after exiting the screen so TM tmnt3 radical rescue what can we say about this game um So the first, so I don't know how all the speed run of it goes, but what you're going to do probably right away is you're going to get a key and then you're going to get some upgrades and then you are going to fight a boss named Scratch. Now, the boss, ba all of the boss battles, not just some, all of the boss battles in, in Turtles 3 are a pain in the rear end um, because you have such you have a short life bar, a limited set of moves, um, and even though like the attack patterns are pretty static with all the enemies, like you're you're still gonna take some damage and get some and get some beat and get some beaten out of you. But after a while, you're going to you're going to beat up Scratch a bit. Um, you're gonna approach him head on. Which is just a terrible idea to do. Because he's going to swipe at you with his claw every chance that he has. Um, 
And if he misses a swing at you, then you want to try and hit him. Um, just like in Turtles games, bosses have iframes, so you can't just mash hit the bosses to kill them. You have to hit them and then time them, uh, especially because they're going to have invincibility frames. Uh, if he swings his chain around, you want to duck and get ready to jump at him, uh, kicking him on the way down to assure that you won't actually be hit at all. Uh, plus, you, you can move away to a dodge the uh, the the claw swipe that is a, that is going to happen no matter what. Uh, with low practice, you'll you'll get through scratch. So we get into chapter two. We're going to rescue Leonardo. And mind you, all of these turtles have special like little actions that they can do too. Like Mikey can like helicopter spin his nunchucks to slow down a fall. Leonardo can turn into like a a, a, a ground drill things like that. Um, this is where you'll also get your first life extension as well too as after you claim Leonardo chapter 3 you're going to get your first access card and then you are going to get basically a, another key and you're going to do uh, another battle with a with a thing called dirt bag. <laughs> okay, reading the notes so it sounded nicer. Um, so, like like Claw Boy, I've already forgot his name. Um, the dirt bag should fall in a few tries. It's, it's safe to attack him up close as long as you can move off of him quickly uh, to avoid to avoid his attacks. Uh, he'll, he'll swing a, a matic around frequently. Uh, Dirtbag always telegraphs his next attacks with a jump. Uh, a single hop backwards means he's going to leap at you. Uh, so stand next to him and he'll fly overhead. Two jumps in place uh, should prompt you to jump yourself because he'll dash across the ground and uppercut you. Uh, get him from behind while he's recovering from this move. If he raises his pick a few times, he's going to jump up and off the screen. Move toward the center of the battlefield and walk towards the nearest wall. He should land behind you, jump as he touches the ground, and hover uh, because the earthquake will stun you, uh, giving him the perfect chance to uppercut you. Uh, if you're too close to him, when he lands, he'll just use his weapon and just beat beat the crap out of you. So, uh, chapter five, we get to save Raphael. And again, these are not like level based at all. Like this is a Metroidvania, so once you have beat something, you move on to the next screen and keep going. Uh, but we're going to break it up in chapters just for the sake of ease, easily listening to. So you're gonna go save Raphael. Um. And then we're going to get another access card, then a third key. Then we are basically going to go into and free Donatello. So now that we have all of the turtles available to us, we're going to go swipe another access card. Um, and then we're going to get more keys. I could tell you exactly how to like navigate through these caverns, but this is going it would be like a five hour episode if I did all that. So we're just going briefing over like kind of the the milestones as you go through TM and TMNT three. Um, so now we're gonna go against Scale Tail. And Scale Tail is <laughs> is hard. I would I would argue probably one of the harder bosses in the game. Um but um, you, you, the, the trick to this is lowering his attacks and getting him while he's recovering. So the tail is the most dangerous form of fighting, uh, but it's probably the, the, the simplest. He'll lash out uh, with his posterior, and in an attempt to uh, actually try and trip you, jump this as soon as you're in range. It has a far reach, uh, and it does a ton of damage. Uh, he'll be pretty vulnerable just after uh, he retracts his tail um, beat him up while he's recovering and then make him whip his tail out again just kind of rinse and repeat the whole whole deal um, this is uh, this is a combat scenario where you should not use Michelangelo 
either, by the way. Um, the hovering ability is is not a good idea for this, this case at all. So chapter 11, we're going to help Splinter. Sub Splinter. Then we have the final journey. This is where the game really ramps up in difficulty. Um, you get to go through the what we call the boss passage, where you get to fight all of those bosses again that you just fought before. And then now you get to face off against Shredder. Um, Shredder has two different phases that it's going you're going to have to deal with. Um, normal Shredder... Uh, you'll make use of pretty much every turtle uh, in existence. Um, your main opportunity to hurt Shredder will be when he crouches and delivers a flying kick. Uh, it takes him a minute to recover from it, so it's a perfect time to just run over, beat the crap out of him, and then rinse and repeat, basically, until you get into what is called Cyber Shredder. Yeah, it's not enough to just take down Shredder once. Now we got to take Shredder down twice. Now he's Cyber Shredder. Um, <laughs> so the offensive strategy here is pretty much the same. Hit him hard when he's using his fly kick, uh, but it's pretty hard to get a clean shot at him simply because uh, uh, he'll he he'll level to, he'll levitate. And produce energy spheres, and uh, he has a new move called the Triangle Kick, which is foretold by a Quick Hop backwards. Uh, stand next to him as he arcs over you, then then deliver some punches when he when he touches down. Um, once you've seen the fight, like uh, these fights are not easy. Like I make them sound very simple. These fights are not easy. Uh, this game took me a long time to beat, and this is the game that's giving a lot of runners a lot of problems right now, too, because the bosses are hard as balls. So, um, once you've done it a few times, you start to recognize the pattern, but even when you start to recognize the pattern, you still get pummeled quite a bit. So having some spare pizzas with you for uh, emergency health is, is crucial. Uh, especially in the boss boss gauntlet that you're about to endure, but that is the ten games for the Tiny Ten, a uh, uh, Tiny Ten Eleventh Edition. Um, for this game, like I said, beat the game is the goal. Game starts upon selecting new game, and your final split is when you hear Cowabunga. Uh, all routes are allowed for this. You can either do any percent or 100 percent. I will say any percent is faster. Passwords are allowed if you game over. And for this game here, world record for any percent is 20 minutes, 54 seconds from two years ago. And then Zorlax 7 was second place at 21 minutes, 32 seconds, three years ago. 100% is 27 minutes and 55 seconds two years ago. And with Zorlax 7, uh, that was by Crazy 8 Boy. Zorlax Zor Zor 7 in second place at 28 minutes and 48 seconds three years ago. Uh, this game doesn't have a lot of love. There are a couple new 100% runs from Smart Alec and Yogario, but outside of that, there is nothing really much new for submissions of this game, so get to it. Any percent's fun, any percent's easy. <clears throat> yep. <laughs> and with that, I'm going to take another quick break, and when we come back, I'll give you some of my th overarching thoughts of the games. Uh, I have I've played all of these games, but a couple of them already, and uh, we'll do our our outro thing. So stay tuned for that. Welcome back, everybody. So yeah, so just a just a quick uh, thoughts and history. I, I, thoughts and history of of the games in this list. I actually think this is probably one of the stronger lists that the Tiny Ten has had in terms of variety, difficulty, and just sheer like exposure. Um, 
I never heard like I never heard of Shipu Iron Leaguer before. Like I've 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 ran Yonkin Man. You know I've never heard of Mital Money My, Mital Money Ex, Idol Exchanger. Uh, I watched Mo play Roadster. But like it's it, this this list has a lot of everything. It's platforming, puzzle, Metroidvania, racing. Um, like there's just a lot. There's a lot to lot to this game in terms of variety for genre. There's a lot of exposure to this game. Like we have th- uh, three or four Japanese exclusive games. We have some games that you you heard of on other platforms, but never knew that they existed on Game Boy or never thought you'd ever play them on Game Boy. Um, I don't know. This is, in my opinion, this is probably one of the one of the better Tiny Ten lists that Mola has put together. Um, and it's going through the games. Like, I, I adore most of these games. I, the only game I really don't like in the list is Mortal Kombat 2 because I don't like any of the Mortal Kombats on Game Boy. Uh, my favorite one being Roland's Curse because I have a unpersonal attachment to that game. But um, I would say, like, if if you're not into speedrunning at all, like, check out the games in a way. Um, you know, load them up, you know, however you legally want to play them. <laughs> and uh, load them up, play them, try them out. They're, they're a lot of fun, uh, especially Shipu and Yonkin Man. Like, they're short Japanese-only platformers. Like, they're adorable. They're cute. It's a good time. Um Roadster, if you're looking for a pretty basic, easy racing game, Roadster's right there for you. Uh, if you're looking for a pretty clean shoot 'em up, um, Gradius Interstellar Assault. If you're looking for a uh, a pretty easy, um, pretty easy action RPG, Roland's Curse. If you're looking for a pretty in-depth Metroidvania game that features your four favorite turtles, TMNT three. Can't recommend that one enough. It's actually a super good game. As as hard as it is, it's a super good game. Um, absolutely adore most of these games on this list, and I'm I'm very excited to uh, very excited to co- uh, commentate this race uh, on November 21st at Retro Gaming Live TV on Twitch TV at 1 p.m. Eastern. So I'll say I'll spit all that stuff again towards the end of the end of the podcast again, but. Uh, yeah, real excited. So with all of that said, we're gonna cut we're gonna cut the podcast there. Outro time. Everyone's favorite part of the podcast. With all of that said, thank you all for listening to this light episode. I'm sorry if it sounds a little jumbled. I actually forgot that our light episode had to come out this weekend. I thought it was next weekend. Because I'm an un- unorganized person. Uh, I, I realized I didn't have a light ready, so, uh, my notes and everything get put together within a few hours. Um, so you can find me, eBloody Candy, on Twitch, Twitter, YouTube, and now TikTok again, uh, and Instagram. You can find my fantastic co-host, Mula at Mula M-O-E-L-L-E-U-H, on Twitch and Twitter and YouTube, I believe. And you can find our beautiful, wonderful, fantastic producer, Sprinty Legs, at Sprinty Legs on Twitch TV and on Twitter and Legs at YouTube and obviously on Discord as well too. And you can go check out her projects that she is doing in her free time uh, at SprintyLegs.com. Um, and see here, oh, Patreon stuff. So we have a Patreon. Uh, if you would like to support the podcast monet- monetarily, uh, we do have offer Patreon tiers. Uh, these tiers do offer various types of rewards, uh, a lot of back end stuff with the podcast and things of that nature. Uh, once we hit twenty dollars a month statically, we'll start doing these episodes in a live stream, so you can just see how dumb we are in between breaks. Um, if you're not into the whole subscription thing on the Patreon, we do have a PayPal as well too. Uh, the only issue with PayPal is that we can't tie Discord and PayPal together. So please, please, we want to reward you. We want to thank you for supporting our podcast with money. So please let the one of three of us know and we will, we will set you up one way or another. Um, if you don't wish to support the podcast with with money, that is 100% okay. 
because you can because you listening to our podcast episodes, leaving reviews, leaving stars, whatever it is that you do nowadays on the internet is more than helpful and it is causing some buzz amongst the retro podcasting world. So again, we appreciate all and any listeners to This Is Game Boy Podcast. And you can find all of this information on thisisgameboy.com. So with all of that said, again, I hope you all tune in to the Tiny 10 uh, Edition 11, 11th Edition, Edition 11, Tiny 10 Number 11 on November 21st, 2020 at 1 p.m. Eastern at twitch.tv slash retro gaming live tv it's going to be awesome it's going to be sweet mo and i are going to be commentating um so essentially be a live podcast episode and the next time you hear from mo and i we will have special guest enemy with us where we talk about ninja gaiden shadow thank you all and talk to you next time Can't believe they made three Madden games.